Hello and in this video we'll be looking at Stabat Mata, occasionally pronounced Mata, uh, by the poet Sam Hunt. Before I begin, uh, credit to my colleague Mr. Martin Walsh who assisted in putting together this presentation. A little bit about the background of Sam Hunt, an interesting poet. He was born on the 4th of July 1946 in Castor Bay, Auckland. His mother was 30 when she had him. His father, a barrister at the time, was 60. Educated at St. Peter's College, Auckland, he was strapped there once um, for reciting a poem by James K. Baxter which contained sexual imagery in the classroom at the age of 14. He was eventually asked to leave the school at the end of year 12. As the young poet, he's more interested in the daily linguistic usage of uh, language and the natural units of speech rather than any special poetic language. And he became very much a performance poet. Many of his poems are characteristically expressions of feelings based on a single surface line, as we'll see in this poem, which leads to a poignant close. And his own experience is the single subject of his poetry, particular moments in his life, loves and losses, uh, and in this a poem, uh, poems about his father and mother, and also other poems about his son. Thinking about the themes of the poem, depending on the gender of children and the culture in which they live, mothers and fathers can be allocated different roles within a family. You might want to pause the video in a moment and look at the examples on the right of the screen and think about for yourself who is more likely to be associated with these particular activities, the mother or a father in a family. Are any activities more likely to be shared? Let's take a closer look at the title. Stabat Mata is Latin for the mother stood. It's a 13th century Roman Catholic hymn to Mary. Uh, it's been variously attributed to the Franciscan Jacoponi de Todi and to Innocent III. There are actually two Stabat Mata hymns. Stabat Mata Speciosa joyfully refers to the Nativity, the birth of Jesus. The Stabat Mata Dolorosa is about the sorrows of Mary at Christ's crucifixion and death. As we take a closer look at the poem, you might like to consider the possible themes. Uh, think to yourself which of these themes is perhaps more relevant to the poem. Are there other themes that uh, have not been mentioned here? We could suggest that stanza 1 uh, presents the reader with a surprising discovery. My mother called my father Mr. Hunt for the first few years of married life. I learned this from a book she had inscribed to dear Mr. Hunt from his loving wife. The key vocabulary to look at here is used to possess pronoun, alliteration, frictive, formal lexis, sense of emotional detachment, and speech marks. The fact that um, there's a certain formality initially in the first line with the reference to mother as opposed to mum or mom, the American, uh, represents the poet's relationship with his parents as being not particularly demonstrative, perhaps emotionally dip, uh, distant. The fact that she called, past tense, my father, Mr. Hunt, sets up a shift into the present tense in the third stanza, which we'll see later emphasizing the contrast between things as they start and things as they become. Uh, does Mr. Hunt uh, symbolize respect or something else? That might become apparent as we go through the poem. For the first few years of married life, the way the alliterative frictive here stems from father, 
perhaps represents that the first few years were something of a honeymoon period before reality dawned. The use of the frictive sound, that alliteration might suggest uh, friction in their, in their married life as it advanced. Also, uh, the fact that the uh, speaker in the poem learned this from a book rather than having it related to him by his mother suggests again the possibility of emotional distance. And they use the very formal word inscribed instead of written. Again, there's a strange sort of formality to um, something that's evidencing a relationship between a husband and wife. The use of the pronoun his, why not your loving wife? is perhaps the mother acknowledging the husband's detachment or maybe it's a sign of her own detachment. With the personal, uh, with the personal pronouns possessive, his, is the reader meant to infer a proprietorial aspect to the husband's attitude? Is it as if he owns his younger wife? In terms of structure, looking at the second stanza, we seem to get some sort of explanation. She was embarrassed when I asked her why but later on explained how hard it had been to call him any other name at first, when he, her father's elder, made her seem so small. Some key elements here, the use of genre, the alliteration, again, formal lexis, use of assonance, connotations of certain terms that have been used, sibilance in the last three words of the stanza, and an aspirate with a repeated h sound. How hard it had been. The stand is dominated by this alliterative aspirate, the ha sound. What is its significance? The husband's domination of his wife? Is it the breathless difficulty implicit in sustaining such a huffed stream of consonants? <sighs> that sign that you're finding it very difficult uh, to express particular emotion. The fact that the father made her seem so small carries the connotation that the mother is deprived of any agency. She's not responsible for herself, even in the realm of her own feelings. Is this intentional on the part of the father, or is it something that was just felt on the mother's part? She's embarrassed to, to talk about this to her son. And the sibilance at the end of the stanza seems so small. Um, in contrast, the sibilance of the last line has got a pathetic effect of falling or fading away under pressure. Her husband was her father's elder, was older than her own father. It's interesting how this assonance, father's elder, forces a comparison between her husband and her own father. Is he just another father figure? Is he happy to take control over the various aspects of her life by making this seem so small? These are the questions raised by this particular stanza. In the third stanza, there are developments. We start to, we're brought up to the present day, we start to understand the characteristics of the relationship as they are now. This use of alliteration, ellipses at the end of the stanza, there's a tense shift to the present, use of euphemism, and certain dehumanizing effect. Now, in a different way, still like a girl, she calls my father every other sort of name. And guiding him as he roams old age, sometimes turns to me as if it were a game. Now and sometimes the temporal markers that echo later on and at first in the previous stanza. Notice how now marks a confident shift into the present tense, only to be followed by the more timid sometimes. From whom does this timidity stem? Is it from still the mother herself? The poet describes her as still like a girl. In what sense? Is this intended as a compliment or a criticism? Is it in the positive sense that she is still youthful or in a more negative sense in that she's behaving immaturely? Every other sort of name is a euphemism implying that with the passage of time, her attitude has become um, much less respectful. She might be referring to her husband now using derogatory remarks. This guiding of the husband as he roams old age implies that in his old age his father has become 
almost like an animal, uh, to be herded around by the mother. How and to what effect does this compare to the original picture of their relationship? Well, it seems as much very, very much the case that the roles have been reversed from this. From this subservient, almost cripplingly respectful relationship to one where she is now her husband's carer and is responsible for his every move. Treating this situation as if it were a game, with this simile, the poet, or perhaps his mother, is trying to put maybe a reassuring slant on quite a disturbing image in which a rational human being has been reduced as we said, almost the level of an animal that needs to be herded around. If the image of a game suggests structure and rules, the alliteration of the T and the M uh, perhaps uh, support this idea. And finally, the stanza ends with the use of ellipses. What is the effect of this? Well, perhaps it refers to the passage of time. Maybe the situation is leaving the speaker speechless at the end, emotionally overwrought, or perhaps it signifies a lack of confidence in what he's saying. Then the poem ends with this rhyming couplet that once I stand up straight, I too must learn to walk away and know there's no return. In this final couplet, Hunt sounds a poignant note by introducing a kind of metaphorical dimension to his dilemma. To what extent can the three phrases in gold uh, be seen to have a meaning beyond the literal one? To stand up straight, to walk away, there's no return. We'll look at that in just a moment. Here we see the second use of the verb learn in the poem also. Is this just a happy coincidence or is the poet trying to tell us something? By using the word to, Hunt implies that he is not the first person to learn this lesson. I too, I as well. Is the first person his mother? Is she learning to walk away? No, there's no return to the previous state of her relationship with his father. If she has learned this lesson, then why would she be happy or seem to be happy guiding her husband through old age? And from what exactly is she asking the poet to walk away? The final couple not only rhymes, but also manages to sustain iambic pentameter. Is this an extra level of confidence about the conclusion after a poem of doubts and secrets? Let's just look quickly at some of the key vocabulary from those final two lines. To stand up straight, uh, does it mean that he's going to take pride, needs to take more pride in himself, become a man, and not allow himself to be bent out of shape by it? other people's need, agendas and needs. And in walking away, is he emotionally distancing himself from his parents' problems? Is he physically leaving home to do that? Or is he realizing that not every situation can be resolved through confrontation? And the fact there's no return, the idea, the understanding that people and places change. By the time he, he comes back and he's left home, his parents may not be there. And the fact that the poet himself will change both physically and emotionally. All these are considerations in understanding the final couplet. Here's some useful links that you might be able to follow to find some more information uh, regarding Sam Hunt. I hope you found the video useful and look out for more videos on the anthology in the future.